Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, here are a few interesting stats for you. Uh, something like 4.7 billion people on the planet can access the internet. 25% of searches are for pornography. And it was recently calculated that if you took the one site alone, Pornhub, and wanted to watch all the material on it, it would take you precisely 173 years. That's truly mind-boggling. Now, has porn become, as we're told all the time, entirely mainstream without a stigma attached? Well, there are certain problems which certainly have been highlighted in recent years. And we want to discuss those and to discuss as well whether in fact there is still such a thing as a moral panic around porn uh, and indeed what are the political responses to it. Uh, now, to discuss this today, I'm very pleased we have three guests. We have Mary Sharp, who is CEO of the Reward Foundation, which is a sex and relationship education charity. Paula Hall, a psychotherapist who specialises in sex addiction and porn and is the author of Understanding and Treating Sex Addiction and from Civitas, Emma Webb. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, could I start really with, with you, Mary? Um, could you sort of tell us, uh, there are sort of certain areas that people who study porn or, or, or in fact where it comes into their work, there are certain areas now where, where there's great cause for concern, particularly for men who use porn. Could you tell us what they are? Well, in recent years, there's been a staggering increase in the rates of sexual dysfunctions, particularly erectile dysfunction in men under 30. Now, up until about 2002, the research indicated about three to five percent of men were experiencing erectile dysfunction, um, usually um, with partners. And it's generally considered an old man's condition, something if they've got congenitive heart failure, obesity or such like. But that two to three percent changed. So from about 2008 onwards, the research just showed steady increases. And we're now seeing rates of around 30 to 35 percent of men under 30 experiencing sexual dysfunctions. That's a thousand percent increase in that period from the time that Internet pornography went on stream. Really? I mean, so, so it, was it just purely about, you know, on, porn going on stream or, or about, you know, the, is, is it were the times involved, you know, the, the um, uploading and things like that? It all became much quicker, didn't it? Yes, well, everything became quicker. And the YouTube type sites are called tube sites because they, they're, they're little videos, two minute videos that are readily available, thousands and thousands, as you said, you know, hundreds of years worth of material. Thousands of videos are suddenly available and they're hardcore, most of them hardcore pornography. So, and since most people access pornography via a smartphone, between the uh, ready availability, accessibility and anonymity of porn through smartphones and all this high definition, huge amounts of material being available, it's just flooded the market and it's made it um, available to everybody and it's mainly free. So this has changed and porn today is totally different from pornography of the past in terms of the way that it impacts on the brain, particularly adolescent brains. I mean, what, I mean, we hear, you know, I don't know if any of you could tell us, but what, what kind of age now do, does your average person first get to know about porn or first see it, would you say? It's about 11 or 12. About 11 or 12. But yeah. also much younger. I mean, if they've got access to phones and the parents don't know necessarily how to use filters or they don't turn the filters on or kids at school are sharing files. The key thing is that around the age of puberty, which is around 10 to 12, 14, depending on, on the, the individual, they are naturally curious about sex. So they're seeking it out. And what they're finding, of course, is hardcore pornography. Mm. Am I right in saying, both uh, Mary and Paula, that you're not actually anti-porn as such, are you? No, I'm, I'm not. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a psychosexual therapist as well. So, and of, of course, many, many millions of people enjoy pornography recreationally in, in the same way as many of us enjoy alcohol recreationally. Um, 
but we we are aware of the potential risks of developing an addiction or compulsivity to alcohol so we have drink aware campaigns uh, we now have gambling aware campaigns and gamble responsibly campaigns because we do understand those connections but we're not necessarily trying to boycott it for everybody and i think this is the challenge that we we really need to begin to face in society is how we do provide the appropriate education for people and as mary says particularly young people and provide services for people for whom it does become compulsive i mean do you think that i'm sorry go ahead no, no, I was just going to say that, that, that while alcohol and gambling are serious problems in society, there's no doubt about that, we don't actually have brain structures for gambling or alcohol. They piggyback on the brain structures for sex, and pornography right. deals directly with those structures in the brain that have evolved to help us mate and have uh, lasting relationships. So it's actually destroyed, pornography destroys our ability to have relationships. Do you think, uh, I mean, you know, we, we hear addiction, uh, you know, uh, a lot today about n n whole different areas. Do you think there is such a thing as sex addiction? Do you, do, you, do you think it is something that actually changes? Well, obviously, the science would seem to suggest it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, from the evidence that I've seen, I'm no expert in this subject and I'm not a scientist, but the fact that there seems to be this sort of, as you would expect with drug use, this... Uh, ever increasing need for a harder hit in order to to um, to, to, to I guess get that that buzz from the pornography. The fact that it escalates, the fact that it results in people going to hardcore porn or child pornography, I think suggests that not only is it an addiction, but it's an addiction that firstly has a really detrimental impact on the way that people relate to others and yeah. to society in ways that are unacceptable but also um, as was already mentioned um, by Mary I think the fact that it disrupts people's relationships with others either through sexual dysfunction um, or simply through you know if you're if you're 10 or 11 years old and the first exposure you have to human sexuality is this uh, exaggerated and sometimes aggressive and unnatural um, view of, of what sexuality is like. You're going to sort of go through puberty marinating yeah. in yeah. something that is not only unhealthy for you, but actually has a, a long-term impact on your ability to function sexually, either from a psychological or a physical perspective. So I think even even whether you class it as an addiction or not, I think the the evidence suggesting all of that, you know, it should probably be treated as an addiction, yes. regardless because it's just such a, a big issue. But I think I think a lot of what you're saying, Emma, can actually be. I, I mean, I don't disagree, but can be counteracted also by good education. So a lot of young people will be introduced to car driving through watching things like Grand Theft Auto. But thankfully, we do teach young people how to drive, and they get in the car with other people. They have other places where they can learn. So I mean, young people pick up all sorts of things through the internet, and regrettably, well, maybe not regrettably, but will never be able to control that. But I think it makes it ever more important to have really good sex and relationship education within schools and from an early age. If the only education a young person gets is from online pornography, that is where we hit the really serious problems. But of course, what we need to ensure is that if we're not able to control that, and we never will fully, that it is balanced by good, solid, realistic sex and relationship education? One of the big issues, of course, is that um, erectile dysfunction certainly is, is an issue, although that doesn't tend to manifest until they perhaps had several years of using hardcore porn. Um, so it's late teens and early 20s that we're seeing that develop. But with younger children, the problem is the violence and coercion that they're seeing in porn, and then they're acting that out with the school pupils. And just this morning, I was reading a law case where a young man lost his appeal. This is in Scotland. He lost his appeal against having his name on what's called the children's list because he committed 
sexual acts, I mean, fumbling and touching, but persistently and coercively with three girls in his class at school when they were in their early teens. Now that's on his record. And he's worried that when he finishes his law degree, that will stop him being able to get a job as a lawyer. What a lot of people and a lot of children don't realize is that the law is taking sexual offending very seriously. And so even sexting or abusive um, behavior when you're young can have many, many years of impact when you're trying to apply for jobs later. And so it's absolutely, Paul is right and Emma too, it's critical that we teach kids about this. We've got a series of free lesson plans available for Scotland, England and Wales and Ireland on the impact of pornography on health, on law and on social relationships. Can I ask you, Sarah, do you if you look at it more, if you look at it broadly, sort of culturally, it's, it's my impression, you know, that if you look at dating sites, which young people and teenagers obviously do, Tinder and sort of all those sorts of sites, is that it, the effect of porn has actually reached there, hasn't it? I mean, people sort of put up very easily at, at what you would call really quite, you know, sort of daring pictures or, or naked pictures or whatever. Is, wouldn't you say that that's a direct result, really, of the pornification of the mainstream? I, well, I think you can take it either way, can't you? I mean, I think that there's no way of knowing of which one came first. We're in a chicken and egg scenario here. And I, I think there, you know, we have to be aware that times are changing. I mean, once upon a time, the Victorians were hiding, you know, piano legs because it was perceived as being, you know, inappropriate. Times have changed. Young people do have different attitudes towards sex and sexuality and I think we have to be careful that we're not applying you know old judgments of normality sexuality has always evolved throughout all cultures all times across all continents it evolves and I mean I I, I think I, I, I understand what Mary means when she says the term hardcore pornography but actually even the definition of hardcore has changed considerably over the last 30 years and I think you know it's so easy to get into these judgments about what is okay and what is not okay how much of a leg a cleavage a torso is considered um, permissible but I think it's more important to look at the the kind of effects of that because otherwise we start going into that moral panic yeah, I well, suppose. I well, one, so, so, yes, sorry, Mary. Yeah. There has been a dramatic rise in child and child sexual abuse. There was a 78% rise in England and Wales between 2012 and 2016, and a 34% rise um, during the equivalent time in Scotland. Now, th this is phenomenal. And, you know, it it's, has um, so much. One of the most popular genres of porn is actually incest porn and kids you know think they can perhaps act this out because most of the the child and child sexual abuse is perpetrated within the family or the friendship circles so i mean and this has a huge impact i say not just on the perpetrators but on the people receiving the abuse on the other side so sorry so, you're saying incest porn by the way or you obviously mean faked up sort of scenarios is, is that what you mean or not yes but the, the brain doesn't know the difference between what's, yeah. what the, what the porn industry euphemistically call faux incest and actual incest they just see you know somebody having sex with their sister or their stepsister or or their mother and this causes massive problems within families so, I mean, and there's all kinds of mental health issues. When children are acting out the type of pornography they're seeing and then they get told it's wrong, they don't know what the boundaries are. They don't know, you know, what's acceptable or not. And then that sends them right back to more pornography because that seems like a safe area. Which is why the education is so important. I, I, I do want to really clarify here. We are talking about in some sentences about sexual addiction or pornography addiction and porn compulsivity, and we're talking about offending. These are not necessarily the same things, and I feel very, very strongly about this, because one of the biggest barriers to people getting help for pornography addiction or compulsive pornography use is the fear of stigmatization. And when we start assuming or saying that pornography addiction leads to offending, 
Um, not only is that inaccurate, yes, there's a percentage who do, but we have no reason for not thinking they wouldn't have done in the first place. And this is the difference between causation and correlation, which is really important to understand. So uh, it's a tiny percentage of people who use it compulsively who may then go on to offend. And that is very different from the issues that, that, that Mary is talking about, which I wholeheartedly support and agree with. But it's not an automatic consequence of addiction at all and that thinking stops people from getting help. I'm really interested to know what um, Mary and Paula think of the developments in uh, the sort of I guess the way that explicit images are hosted on the internet so things like OnlyFans in relation to child sexual abuse because I've seen some suggestions that some of the people on OnlyFans are you know can be quite young that the the age limit isn't necessarily always um, accurate um, particularly because of what Mary said about um, the way that these things piggyback on our psychology about sex in relation to gambling because there are some elements of OnlyFans that are akin to gambling the the, the expectation of um, getting content that is sort of locked and then people pay for it and it's it's um different from the sort of i guess different from the psychology surrounding just getting images images or videos a click away for free and that's almost like fast food like a quick fix people seem to have sort of now shifted to wanting the anticipation of things like only fans which in a way kind of mimic a, almost like a long distance relationship or something mm -hmm. where they can talk to the person and they have access they they pay uh, money for access to you know private videos and things like that does that have an impact on the way that um the, the way that particularly young people will relate to other people because of their experience of the, that kind of pornography can you explain actually only fans right for people who don't yeah know, this is so OnlyFans seems to have been something that has kind of peaked during lockdown for obvious reasons. It's a kind of, I, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know, but it's a, it's a platform None of, of us uh, know. <laughs> None of us know. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a platform where people, can, and again, I think it's really important to understand how the porn industry has evolved. So mm -hmm. OnlyFans really has been set up by people putting their own content online. So this isn't all about pornographers going out there with a camera, finding some porn stars or unsuspecting whatever. Uh, these are, you know, many of them are young women who are deciding to create images of themselves, to take videos of themselves, to put online, and then you can subscribe and follow whoever it is. Um, I mean, the age is a really, really interesting thing, Emma, and I, I think it's a problem we have with the World Wide Web. OnlyFans was set up by um, someone in Russia initially. Uh, the age of consent is different around the whole world, which again is where we end up with so many problems when it comes to trying to, to legalize this content. So these are typically young women who are posting their own videos and getting fans to follow them, subscribe, pay money so it's a different way of producing pornographic content and that is changing as well all the time so whenever we're having these conversations about pornography um yes of course the tube sites revolutionize pornography but it is continuing to evolve all the time and there are new ways of doing it and some of that hardcore stuff is actually becoming less and less popular now because of the the own creation porn through things like only fans i think that's because it feels more relational it feels as though you're having more of a relationship with that person which you know as emma's alluding to i think mimics offline relationships which you know, many people are looking for and haven't been able to have during covid and my understanding is that only fans is predominantly sex workers who use it so if children are using it it fits in with what we've been hearing about in schools where a lot of young people want career advice on how to become a porn performer because they think it's glamorous and fun and they can make lots of money. The sad reality make is... lots of money, many of them. Most, yeah. Yes, some can. But the sad reality is that most porn performers don't last more than three to six months because of the tremendous mental and physical health impacts of acting in, in porn uh, sites. 
But the, the thing about the, the internet in general, and Emma's right, you know, looking at it a little bit like gambling sites or, or, or gaming sites, it's the constant novelty at a click and this sort of heightened reality, this, this excitement. Everything seems so much better than everyday reality. And what happens over time is that a young person's brain becomes desensitized. They have a numbed pleasure response to everyday pleasures and everyday reality. The only thing that gets them excited is porn. So forget about schoolwork. And we're hearing this from teachers that kids are just not as interested in their work. They can't pay attention. They're not getting enough sleep at night. Um, they come in exhausted. And you know you can see why you know that th this would happen. It's curious. Um, one of the areas that I was looking at was the work developed um, at Stanford University by a professor B. J. Fogg, who in the mid '90s developed what's called the Persuasive Technology Lab. And for instance, one of the, the students that he had, and he's had many students, but one of them was a, one of the co-founders of Instagram, which now has more than two billion followers. The, they deliberately they, they teach their students at Stanford in this, this um, lab um, how they teach them about the reward system of the brain and how to get people hooked. So they use neuroscience and psychology to tap into people's most vulnerable, the most vulnerable part of their brain to get them hooked and to actually make them want to repeat the behavior. So that level of manipulation is what's being used across the internet to make people um, keep going back for can, more. Can I, ask I mean, I think that that's another whole debate about social media and Facebook and uh, US elections potentially, and goodness knows what else, isn't it? That, uh, that comes and just, up. just with the sex, the problem is regarding sex, it, it's having a serious impact on young people. And the, the UK, the government are very slow. I mean, they're trying, but they're so slow to do anything in response to it. I mean, the, the Digital Economy Act was brought out in 2017, but they failed to implement part three that dealt with age verification legislation. This is what I was going to actually ask, because I, I think that this is something that most people would think is a kind of commonsensical uh, measure, you know, just age verification. Are we saying that we actually don't have that yet? I mean, this, no. I, I mean, going back to, was it David Cameron's time? I think this came up, didn't it? It was, it was around yes. about then. And, and that would just mean that you had to show that you were over what, 18 or 16 or, yeah? Anybody yeah. can access pornography from any device, including Playstations. Remember Playstations yeah. and Xboxes, they're all attached to the internet as well. And that's, that's a device that, that people often forget. Um, yeah, anybody can access it anywhere. And there are some porn blockers, porn protectors, but if you want to know how to get one around one of those, ask a 12-year-old boy and he'll show you how to get around it. Okay. <laughs> I think if you, if you, like, we were talking about social media as well, that you're sort of looking at it holistically, the environment that kids who are, you know, like 12 or going through puberty, that they're surrounded by, there's the constant draw of, as, as Mary mentioned, the uh, social media like Instagram, constantly scrolling through their feeds, constantly hankering after likes. I think I saw something on Twitter the other day where someone had gone to buy a notebook and found that the only thing that, uh, available for young kids as a journal planner for 2021 that they could find was um, how to be an influencer. And it had things like where to list your likes and follows and things like that, that they're surrounded by almost like the social equivalent of fast food, this quick hit culture where they just want to get the likes and the endorphins and everything and the fact that that's all mixed up with this uh, probably I would say the increasing sex sexualization of children just within the media generally um, things like cuties that I don't think we would have seen 10 years ago that wouldn't have been acceptable um, the, the the way that you know children present themselves on these platforms as well and that all muddied up with the the quick fix of porn and 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 all of that kind of sort of uh, endorphin here i think that's the thing that really worries me because if you think about not just with lockdown but before um the just general atomization of society and the ways that we relate to each other we obviously have some kind of crisis in in our social world and i think the pornographic side of that is really important because if we think like 10 or 20 years from now 
when those kids are grown up and uh, adults, you know, we already have plummeting birth rates. The last thing in the world we need is loads of sexual dysfunction and people who don't know how to properly relate to each other. I know, I, I, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I, also, there's this other point, uh, more generally, you, you were talking about, you know, the effect on young people. Um, but isn't it also has a big effect, surely, culturally, on body image? You know, yes. in, in the sense that w the people that are in porn now um, are quite different to the porn, the, the people who were in porn in the 1970s. It's, it's a bit of a cliché joke, isn't it? But, but the thing is, is it's, it's gone into the whole culture. So, you know, even actors in Hollywood now look, they're always ripped, you know, they're always sort of like hairless. Uh, and yeah. all of, this must have the most enormous effect, surely, on how young people see see their bodies. I, but I, th I think that, I mean, that is one side of it, but you can find anything in pornography. You can find absolutely anything. And some of those, yeah, exaggerated hips and other parts and what have you that, that have been ever since, you know, pre-Raphaelite days, we've been kind of celebrating the human form in a slightly exaggerated way. That has always been around. And yes, that is certainly in pornography. But there is also a lot more kind of amateur pornography, older generation, grandma, MILF pornography around that ever used to be before. These are all very new kind of genres and again i think i suppose i'm very mindful there are a lot of people out there who think that um porn addiction is is just a complete myth it's something that's made up by you know prudes puritanical prudes who are trying to um you know go back to the sort of days of um you know, there being absolutely nothing available at all, prohibition. And I, I think we need to be careful not to be falling into the common trap of this actually becoming an anti-porn discussion. Because yeah, no, no one, so I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think anyone's saying it's an anti-porn discussion. I, mean, I don't think any of us are anti-porn as such, but I mean, it, it's, it's, a question, it's a question of, unless, I, I don't know if you are, but I mean, um, you know, I, what I would say is, with this is, uh, for example, I think probably I'm about to fall into your trap that you just mentioned. Um, but, uh, you know, what difference in terms of relationships? If, for example, one partner in a relationship is looking at porn an awful lot, is that the same as being unfaithful? I mean, is that the sort of thing that basically would bring some, uh, a marriage to, to break up or a partnership to break up? I mean... Or, or have we changed I mean, our attitude there? Yeah, what, what what you said being unfaithful, what what damages a relationship, and I'm a relation, you know, sex and relationship psychotherapist, that's what I specialise in, what, what breaks up a relationship is a breach of trust. Whatever that relationship is, if you break the trust within a relationship, if you cheat on your partner, then yes, that's going to cause problems. But every relationship will have a def different definition of what that is. So, you know, there are many people out there living in very happy, content, open, non-monogamous relationships where actually, but they still have rules. They still have their, their kind of conditions of what is okay and what is not okay and, that, and how they should operate. So if you are breaching trust in your relationship by watching pornography, then yes, that is going to be as detrimental as to the relationship as having a flesh-on-flesh -flesh encounter with somebody if you're in a monogamous relationship so but no every person who's watched porn has not brought the end of their their relationship um so it's it's, it's down to what's okay in your you know between you and your partner would you agree with that um well loath as i am to go back to the subject of only fans um somebody said on twitter the other day that if you if your girlfriend has only fans you don't have a girlfriend i think the changes in the i mean would you agree with that there's uh, um, to some extent, I think this is a moral and ethical problem, and I expect I probably differ slightly on my sort of moral view of, of pornography, uh, what, not just people who... What's your moral view of it, then? Um, Well, I, I think that both taking part in pornography and watching pornography is morally questionable, um, but, you know, it's interesting that, you know, that people have different views on, on this, and it actually tends to be that people on the right, the libertarian right, yeah. have the most permissive attitude towards porn, not just pornography on sort of like the traditional pornography, but also things like OnlyFans and even the, the wide availability of pornography on things like Twitter. Um, and it's actually tends to be people from the left, from the sort of 
maybe not the woke left, but more feminist left, um, pro probably the same sorts of people who would overlap with being accused of being a turf, um, who would say that um, pornography is detrimental from a, to, to women from a feminist perspective. So um, I think there's a whole separate moral discussion to be had around that. We yeah. don't really seem to be able to have a moral discussion about it because I think... We've given Gen up on morality? Or yeah, I think there's too much of a... Because I'm coming at this from a Christian perspective, yeah. and yeah. so my views on this are what you would expect a Christian perspective to be. Um, but I think that we have... It's Mill's classic problem of, um, you know, when you have an agreement about custom in society, then you can have a discussion. But we, we're too morally diverse, and I think on the pornography um, subject, there's such a wide range of, of moral opinions on it and they don't fit in the political categories that you would usually expect them to, to be in. I think that's very true. I mean, could we, could, sorry. Yeah. I think also, Emma, there, there's, a, you know, there's such a huge definition of what is pornography. So, you know, if you start going, you know, once upon a time, Michelangelo's David would have been considered pornographic. And depending where, it, and I don't think any of us disagree that child abuse images you know, underage images of children who have been sexually abused are wrong, are morally reprehensible and wrong. And um, that anybody who is on the internet grooming young people, it's absolutely wrong. You know, we're, we're, that's pretty unequivocal. But there are different definitions. So when is something sex education? When is something you know, somebody who is uh, from a diverse sexual group looking for other people in a similar situation online where it is liberating, where it's actually providing opportunities for them to connect and but, actually have a healthy sex life with them. And there are those people out there. It all depends what you are talking about. And this is what makes it so difficult. There is no doubt a lot of porn is unethical, but I do believe some of it is. And each of us will have a different definition of what that is. I don't think it's just the child sexual abuse material that is reprehensible or morally debatable. I was using that as an example. I'm, I'm saying we would all agree. Yeah, well, that's, the most extreme. That that's the most extreme example. Yeah. But there's plenty of um, incest porn, as I say, torture porn. There's lots of um, types of porn that are really not helpful to people. Strangulation. One of the biggest, the fastest growing areas just now is strangulation porn. Now, it's part of, the, the, there, are, there are kink communities, BDSM uh, groups, bondage, domination, sadomasochism, who um, agree, consent amongst themselves that if, they, if the pain is too much, they, they have a safe word and can say it, and th then the other person stops. But children are watching this, and in fact, um, there was a survey done in 2019 by the Sunday Times and of the Gen Z, the under 22 year olds, BDSM and rough sex were one of the most popular porn genre uh, amongst them. Now, you, you can, that's not child abuse material, but this, this, they are, a lot of people are acting this stuff out without having a safe word, without having the safety that maybe adults in the kink community might use. But, Sorry, um, the, the have, kink community. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, one of the sexual minority groups, sexual adventurers, if you like, but they are acting that stuff out. So, if it's done within, you know, consenting adults and they've got safety words, that's what they might do. But there's a lot of children watching this stuff because they get a bigger sexual high the more. Um, you know, anxiety making the material is. They get adrenaline that mixes with other neurochemicals that give them a bigger sexual high. Being strangled, where, where there's actually a restriction on um, oxygen to the brain, gives a bigger sexual high. But that can go too far and the person ends up dead. But even, even without, even if it's non fatal strangulation, there's been excellent research. We've got a blog on our website about it. Um, a, a doctor says that a lot of the, the damage is hidden. So when somebody's being strangled, it can cause a stroke, it can cause a miscarriage, it can cause all kinds of brain damage that is not even showing up when the police investigation is done. So, you know, there, there's, and given that that is such a popular genre amongst young people, is really quite worrying. 
can I, can I, uh, Emma did uh, bring something up actually, which I just wanted to go into just a little bit, um, which was about the political response, which I think is very, very important that, you know, if you grew up in the 70s, like I did, we had Mary Whitehouse, as you mentioned earlier, um, but we also, it was definitely a case that you, that the um, porn was um, a sign of, you know, a disintegrating society that basically, you know, we had to ban it or at least it was, it was, it was a bad thing, right? Um, it seems to me that the position, and Emma has actually already said this, that on the, what you might call the right or a certain, uh, there is, there's no feeling of that anymore. It's very much, you know, if there's a market for it, then there's a market for it and great, you know, do what you want to do so long as it doesn't, you know, frighten the horses or whatever. But, um, but basically, on the other hand, I wondered, and this is a bit of an off-the-wall question, but is there, a, is there a woke position on porn, pornography? Is there a woke one? You know, we hear about woke an awful lot. We discuss it endlessly on this show. What is the woke attitude to porn? I would suggest that um, amongst feminism, uh, amongst feminists, now Emma mentioned, fe brought up feminism earlier, there are two types, two main groupings of um, feminists around this, the pornography issue. There's the old style radical feminists who say that all porn is bad because it's objectification of women for the male gaze and therefore it's bad. And that was the Andrea Dworkin type position from the 70s and, and, and going forward. Gail Dines, Dr. Gail Dines is one of the main proponents of that um, today. Um, but the modern, the so-called liberal feminists would say porn's good because it's liberating. It, it's empowering women. Women can do it. But there's this failure to understand the impact it's having on the brain, the impact that it's having on their need for, for increasing levels of porn and more extreme porn in order to get the sexual high. But that doesn't happen for everybody, Mary. No, I didn't suggest for a minute. And, and we, both, we both work with the people for whom that does happen. They, I mean, yeah. the Laurel Centre, particularly in through COVID, our inquiries have doubled with young people struggling with porn addiction, including women. We keep talking about men. This is affecting more and more women. So yes. for those people where it escalates, absolutely. But it doesn't happen for everybody. And I think this is where you end up getting caught between I these two camps. So and being able to have a conversation and not, yeah, not get into this kind of porn panic debate because for some people they can watch it sensibly and that doesn't happen to their brain any more than they get addicted to alcohol. Well, I didn't suggest, first of all, that it was happening to everyone, far from it. But since the problems tend to escalate over a period of time or rather incubate over a period of time, we don't know, um, Nestle, you know, that it um, that it won't lead for some, for some, to and compulsive sexual behaviour disorder or even addiction. I think we need protection for young people on the internet because I think Mary's absolutely right that there's no way of um, knowing kind of the, the impact it has particularly on young people's brains and they don't have the access to the other information as well. We need that and we need education. Good sex and relationship education and age verification or whatever it would take, and I think that that proved to be very challenging, unfortunately, is absolutely what we need. And this should be something that's cross-party, looking at the fact that actually pornography has evolved and we need new ways. We can't put it on the top shelf anymore. We need new ways of managing something that is very new, and we just do not have that at the moment. I think... Uh... Just to, just one other final point is that when I was talking about what I mean, I think that the what what you said, Mary, about there about uh, feminist attitudes to porn. I think those those are the ones I I recognise. You know that they've been around for quite a while. I, I I think that what is interesting is that you might start to get interference or views at least expressed about the various types of pornography, i.e., sexual politics that comes into it. You know. All of that aspect. I think that because, as you said, it, there's virtually nothing that you can't see now. But I mean, you know, I, I'd imagine depictions, even in porn, will start to actually come under scrutiny of uh, woke censorship. Maybe. Actually, I th this is a really, I think this is a really interesting subject. The mashup between not just you know like political opinions 
of porn, um, but the mashup between natural mashup, I think, between sexuality, violence, and politics. Because I was doing some work last year on grooming gangs, and so I was following some of these pretty horrendous hashtags. Um, I won't say what they are because I don't want anyone to go looking them up. Um, but they, these hashtags lead you down a horrific rabbit hole. Um, and at the time of all of the BLM stuff, there was loads of sexually explicit images, even available on Twitter, um, uh, you know, I guess you would call it BLM porn, but it wasn't really so much, you know, sexual. It was about um, uh, a pretty toxic dynamic yeah. in race relations, let's yeah. say, euphemistically. That's how I'm going to put it. Um, and I think that is something that is um, pretty toxic in terms of social relations because people will look at that and it, it won't only affect their sexual relationships with others or social relationships with others it also meshes into this entire sort of toxic um political atmosphere and so um i you know it's i think that's something that's really worrying that never really gets discussed um but yeah, yeah that's a very, very interesting point then i think we have to leave it there because uh you know it's it's uh, getting on for lunch time. I know some of you are going to rush off for lunch. <laughs> but thank you very, very much, Paula. Thank you very much, Mary, for joining us. Thank you, Emma, uh, for a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, that's it for Counterculture this week. Um, and uh, we shall see you next time. Thank you. Bye.